Welcome everybody and thanks for tuning in. Today we're going to be going over how to dial in a DSLR with your brand new glide cam. Well, maybe it's not brand new. Maybe you were just so frustrated that you set it in the closet or the corner and it's been collecting dust ever since. Either way, let's break them out. Let's get it hooked up. Let's get it balanced. and Let's get that thing rolling so you can get some of that footage you've been dreaming about. I'm Andrew Johnson. I'm a mass communication specialist in the United States Navy. And the reason I'm here talking with you today is that I have spent hours and spent uh, more time and frustration than I care to admit banging my head against the wall trying to get this thing balanced. I have finally got it. I have searched through the ends of the internet for advice and I'm willing and more than excited to answer all of your questions and let you know that I am a resource and more than willing to help you uh, get your glide cam set up and ready to rock. As we get started, let's look at the different options. Today we're going to be going over the XR4000 in particular and the, and the XR series in general. But just looking at the three, you've got the XR1000, the 2000, and the 4000. The main thing to note is that they are, they're, they're designed for different weight capabilities. So whether you're shooting in a broadcast camera or your DSLR or even like a handy cam, they've got something for you. Now, in, outside of the XR, there are some other more uh, pro-style series available setups. And, you know, it's, it's like everything else. You're going to get what you pay for. They might make it a little bit easier to, to make little minor tweaks and adjustments. And as we get going here, you'll see how this one can be cumbersome. But for the value, it is an incredible tool. And you'll be glad that you've got it once you get it balanced. All right, so looking right out of the gate, it's it's fairly intuitive to put this thing together. I mean, it's a series of just threading together uh, one piece to the next. Everyone on here, I'm sure, is intelligent and has got literally no problems. I know you made it through this part without even opening the book, which, let's face it, most of us probably didn't read the manual. You could get it built without the manual. I know I did. However, I did try to use the manual to balance it the first time with absolutely no success, which is probably why you're here. So let's move right along. This is, hands down, the number one most important tip that I want to make sure that I, I, I sink it in. You need to stage your camera exactly like you're going to be shooting it. Now, as we get, get going on and, and we get our camera mounted onto the, onto the glide cam, you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. But everything from the camera strap to the position of the on-off switch, you know, making sure your batteries are in there, uh, a compact flash card, as small and as lightweight as that can be, can really throw everything off. And the last thing you want to do is be in front of a client, have your glide cam in hand, pop the lens off or the lens cap off, take a hit the switch on to on, turn your live view on, you're ready to shoot, and you realize that your rig is nowhere even near as close to balanced as you once thought it was. So stage your camera exactly. When you're balancing it in, you need to have it set up precisely. I'm telling you, it will it will save you a lot of frustration in the end. The second thing that I really want to emphasize is lens selection. And now this is this is more than just you know what's in your bag. You know when I first started, it, I had the holy trinity of lenses. I had the 70 to 200, the 24 to 70, and the 14 to 24. So it was a given for me. The 14 to 24. It's wide. It's prime. It's beautiful. It's a great lens for this option. However, it's pretty heavy. So whenever you have that zoom option, you know you're going to have some weight restraints in there. So a fixed lens might give you a little bit more versatility in terms of uh, arm stamina. So you're not going to get tired nearly as quick. So that's something to keep in mind is the weight of the lens itself. Obviously, wide angle is going to make your life a lot easier. After you've gotten some practice and you've dialed this thing in a few times and you've done a few shoots, I've seen people shooting with 85mm prime lenses and they're loving their footage. I will tell you that I've shot with 50 and it looks fine. You just really need to get get a little bit of practice under your belt before you go with the longer focal lengths because the wider you are, the, the more forgiving that footage is going to be when you've got a little bit of a roll effect or a little bit of shake going on in there. And not so much shake, just movement. So that's really important. The second thing to remember, if you're going to use a kit lens, which there's nothing wrong with that, or if you're going to use that 14 to 24, set your focal length at whatever you're going to be shooting at and leave it there. Whether you want to mark it off with gaffer's tape or just know that you're going to be shooting at the widest or at the tightest uh, focal length, just set it in because any movement internally in that lens is going to shift and distribute the weight in a different way than you had it balanced and you're going to be starting back at the drawing board. So camera set up, know what lens you're using, have it set up exactly the way that you're going to want it to work. 
All right, moving right along. The next tip is one of the things that I have seen more people make mistakes on initially, right out of the gate. And that's, it's going to come with all of these large and small washer weights, and you're just going to want to just stack them on there because you think, you know, more weight is better. And not only does that make it more, more stressful on your arm and your, your shooting stamina, it's just not necessary. I'll tell you right now, start light. You can always add, you can always subtract once you get going, but Give yourself a good base, and with a little bit of practice, you'll figure it out. My tip right out of the gate, start with two. I put two large weights on both ends, and I've had a lot of success with that, and then we'll get to how we can adjust the distance from the weight plate to the camera uh, in just a moment, and that's another way that you can kind of segue that, that balance, uh, but start light. Do not, do not stack them up there just because you have them. I promise you will be, uh, you'll be frustrated when you get around to it. The next decision that you have to make is going to be mounting the camera onto the base plate. Now, let's just throw an asterisk up really, really fast. A quick release plate will make your life so much easier. If you have one, congratulations. If you don't and you can buy one, buy one, acquire it, whatever you have to do. Otherwise, you'll end up like me without one. And I will tell you that when you have to change your battery, it becomes a deal breaker. So you really have to be conservative with your footage. So get a quick release plate. Either way. What you're aiming to do here is to mount the camera in the center, the, the center of gravity along with this plate. So depending upon whether you're shooting Nikons, uh, Canon, Sony, whatever it might be, the battery location could shift the weight of the camera. Uh, I tend to use the centermost slot uh, near the back. And this is fine. Find one that's kind of in the middle. We'll be able to, to make some adjustments momentarily that'll really kind of compensate for where you, where you go here. Uh, just just know that you need to make an educated move here. You're going to need to kind of figure out where the weight is located on that on your setup. All right, so next off, we're going to talk about some of the adjustments. Now, these are the adjustments that you can make, just like we talked about, that can that can balance out where the camera's center of gravity is going to be. You'll see on the left the, the bottom four set of, of adjustment knobs. Now those are going to be used to dial in left and right or horizontal movements. So once you pick up your camera and your glide cam tips to the left, you'll be able to slide it to the right using this. Um, this is one of those examples where the more expensive models make this a little easier. Here what we'll have to do is literally loosen the adjustment screws and then slide them manually by hand very very small adjustments we want to make millimeter size I'm talking very very small movements will make all the difference in the world now on the sides those adjustment screws you'll have two on each side those are multi-purpose not only will they fasten the plate onto the glide cam itself but they're also going to be what you'll need to loosen to slide the camera body forward and backward uh, so those are going to be things that you want to do once you have your camera hopefully on a quick release plate unlike mine onto the plate itself mounted on there get them on there not super tight because we're going to be making a lot of adjustments but get it on there just enough that you can pick it up comfortably without it falling over and what we're going to do now is we're going to we're going to get to the tricky part this is where holes get punched in walls and the reason why glide cams sit in corners and never get used ever again because this is where it gets frustrating don't worry we're going to fix it so what we need to do is we need to start out with the glide cam camera mounted on top of a flat surface so find a table find a counter use the floor whatever you got find something flat now with your dominant hand and a hammer style grip, I like to point my thumb up towards the top. Just very smoothly raise the glide cam up using your, your non-dominant hand as just a, a support there. Because all we're looking for here is which direction the camera is going to tilt. And it's going to tilt. And it's going to tilt the next 5 to 15 times. So just <laughs> expect it. It's no big deal. Perfectly normal. We're going to make some adjustments to move it. The key to know about your adjustments is that they really need to be very, very small. Think like millimeter moves here. So whether you're adjusting the adjustment knobs on the bottom or on the sides, you know, maybe take one hand and hold it underneath and that way you can feel the amount that you're actually sliding and just do very, very minor adjustments. Just little bitty tweaks will make all the difference in the world. And this kind of will remind you when we talked about making sure your, your on off switch is in the right spot, or your lens cap is off. If you're going to add an ND filter, make sure you do it all here because these are the adjustments that you're going to have to redo if you add or remove equipment from your rig. So definitely take some time here. Give yourself uh, plenty, plenty of room to do it. I would say 15 to 30 minutes, and that number will, will shift down uh, with, with a lot of practice. So pick it up. It's going to tilt forward really, really hard, no problem. Set it back down. Use the side adjustment knobs. Slide it back and tighten it up again, and let's go again. And this is just going to be a rinse, wash, repeat. We're going to keep doing it and doing it until we can get it close. Now, 
let's say you've been at it for a little while you've got it where it looks like it's not going anywhere crazy but you've got a little bit of a drift no problem there are other adjustments that we can make to kind of help us out with this physics equation of the glide cam now I'm not much for math that's why I got into creative and being a storyteller I'm assuming you're probably in the same boat now on the actual uh, the, the pole of the glide cam there is another adjustment knob now what this will do it will increase or decrease the distance from the camera to the base plate weights now this is great let's say we're trying to use as lightweight as possible perhaps you should extend that pole giving yourself a little bit more distance and what that'll do is it'll help balance out the overall rig and it'll give you that that smooth look if you're picking it up and you're walking and you stop and you get that horrible inertia roll where the camera just keeps going you know you either have a too much weight which is probably the case or you need to make some adjustments with the pole so you can kind of combine the two and we're gonna move into drop time in just a second and that's something that we can we can kind of go back and forth so hopefully when we have gotten those adjustment knobs we've got them close to dialed in even if they're not perfect because we can always go back now you see here on the slide I also have the camera set in manual or the lens set in manual focus that's just a, a habit of mine I like it that way I can make my adjustments beforehand uh, and some cameras you know they even have you know internal components that kind of kind of help show you in a, a visual reference of whether or not that is going to be something that is uh, nice and level for you now keep in mind you can balance it at an angle whether you want to point up or down slightly depending upon your height or the shot that you're looking for those are all options that you can do okay so we think we've got the weight balanced properly we've got the right number of weights on the bottom we got our rig set up the way we're going to shoot with it we've got it pretty good let's check the drop time now with drop time you're looking for two to three seconds and it's a real simple one one thousand two one thousand boom now personal preference will tell you whether you want to be closer to two or closer to three experiment a little find something that makes you happy and I have found that once you get it pretty close to balanced adjusting the pole length is a really good way to, to narrow down this drop time and get you in a happy medium and get it somewhere where it's nice it's workable and it's something that you can uh, you can take out and start shooting okay so we're almost there your glide cams getting close and there's one more tip that I really really want to have sink in because it's gonna make it's gonna make your life a little bit easier so there's a real important thing to understand, and that's the difference between a workable glide cam and a absolutely 100% perfectly balanced glide cam. Let's set ourselves up for success and understand that we're not using a dolly, that we're not on a slider or on a jib, but what we can do is get our glide cam close enough to, to simulate a lot of those camera movements in a really smooth, nice fashion because we can spend all the time in the world trying to get this thing perfect, and if we walk outside to shoot and it's windy, all bets are off so let's just get it better than handheld let's get it something workable and then through practice you can get it closer and closer and closer to perfect but you'll go ahead and you'll start getting footage and it's a good idea at this point to start thinking about what kind of shots you're going to be using and I want to show you a little bit about how I have used this and we're going to get into some examples in just a second but let's look at picking it up you know you want to use that that hammer grip and keep the keep the glide cam elbow as tight as you can to your body because that 90 degree angle nice and close that's going to keep your arm from getting as fatigued it's also going to give you a more stable platform and you're going to use your other hand to actually rotate the glide cam so just very very subtly you're going to be using that to spin and once you've got it nice and balanced you'll see here with a workable glide cam we've got some nice movement without a whole heck of a lot of roll right there it's not hundred percent perfect but it's workable well hopefully we've got our glide cams in a pretty usable state and like I said mine's not a hundred percent at this point but it is workable so let's look at some practical examples and you can see what I'm doing as well as what the camera is actually capturing now using layered footage foreground background that is a huge thing to incorporate whenever you're using camera movements the way you, you know the same shots you would use with a slider or with a jib so as I'm raising there you can see the reveal of the subject so up and down left and right movements those are really some of my go-to moves uh, reveal shots are also really really nice now other things uh, going up and down stairways through hallways following your subject you know, utilizing focus points following action again like a slider moving around taking a subject that's just still and not doing anything interesting and here you can see what happens when you're on a ship and you're moving around when the when the water's not cooperating with you perfectly balanced doesn't even matter 
uh, but the sliding shots, the reveal shots, a lot of consistency here, and you can really use it in a lot of different environments. It's a lot lighter. It's got a much smaller footprint than a slider might when you go on an assignment or on a job, and once you've got a couple of key go-to moves in your arsenal, break those shots out and you know, use them and practice them. Think about what you're going to shoot. Try it a couple of times. Practice it and then hit record and just see what you can capture. Now it also works really well when you're when you're trying to show a scene or in an environment and you could do it like a tour or like walking through some space and kind of introducing your audience to to what's going on and giving them a, a nice uh, in-depth look into what the scene what's going on there. Now you see this a lot in some of the higher end productions. I mean a lot of us have seen Goodfellas where these really long shots go down and uh, they're just gorgeous. Uh, but layering your footage, here's a reveal shot where the camera started in front of the in front of the hammock and pulled back. I mean, those are all things that you can do that really, really just bring up great footage um, going up and down between levels. Again, you can see like a slide. And this is just a couple of small examples, just kind of get your wheels turning so you can so you can grab your camera and your new rig and just go out there and just try some new things. Don't be scared to experiment. And don't forget, you know, when you're editing, you need start and stop points. So you're going to have to think about where are you going to incorporate this. And these, these moving footage, this moving shots, you know, they're going to be pretty short in your final piece. Uh, but there's definitely a place for them. If anybody has any questions, please, please leave comments on the page. I'll be happy to answer anything that you've got. And uh, I hope that you got something out of this. Thank you.